good morning, Bright City. It is so good to be with you all this morning. I know some of you, I hate to interrupt, but there's others of you that are like, it says zero. It's time to move on. Uh, my name is Ike Miller. I'm one of the pastors here. And one of the things that we say every week is that we exist to help you take your next step towards Christ. And we believe that that is something that can be true if you are brand new to church and checking things out, or if you have been a follower of Jesus all your life, we can all take another step towards Christ. And so that's what we exist to help you do. And if you are here with us this morning, uh, your first step is just to let us know that you're here. We would love to know that you're here to connect with you, to help you find a home here at Bright City, to help you find relationships. Uh, And so you can do that in a couple of ways. There is a card in your cup holder that you can fill out, or you can scan the QR code here, and there's a little button that says connect and fill that out, and we'll follow up with you. But would love to meet you. After the service, we do something called First Step, where Sharon will be out at our Next Steps booth. You can go and uh, ask her all of your hard, piercing questions, uh, or the easy ones, whatever, but she would love to meet you and help you get connected as well. Another step that we invite everyone who calls Bright City home to take is giving. Giving is the way that we tangibly demonstrate the priority of God in our lives. And so we want to invite you to take that step into the joy of generosity. And there's a couple of ways to do that as well. You can do that online at brightcitychurch.com slash give. Or again, you can go to the QR code and hit give. And then lastly, the the third step we invite everyone to take is to serve on a team. Uh, Serving on a team is how we fulfill God's vision to be a fully functional church and that we believe every person in the church has a role to play and a part to play in the body. And so we invite you to do that both for your own growth, but also for you to experience more of what it's like to, to follow Jesus. We believe serving is a crucial way of growing in our discipleship. And so I want to invite you to take that step. And again, you can do that by hitting the QR code or filling out the little card in your folder. And all of our teams would love to have more on that team. And so I invite you to do that. A couple of announcements this morning. First of all, this is a very big Sunday for us. This is our winter small group kickoff Sunday. And so we've got uh, all of our small groups leaders that have open groups are going to be out in the lobby after the service. And so I invite you to stop by the tables to meet some of the small group leaders to find out what those small groups are about uh, and consider joining a group. If you've been looking to join a group, this is your chance. And uh, all of the groups are going to be doing a similar uh, study this this run of groups um, called Practicing the Way, and we're going to be looking in particular with Sabbath and the practice of Sabbath. Uh, This group will run February through April, and so I want to invite you to join in on one of those groups. If you're not able to stay after, I believe there's a link in the QR code that you can go to as well. And then lastly, one of the things that is so important to us as a church, a value that we have, is we want serving at Bright City to be a life-giving experience. Uh, We realize that serving is not always easy, easy. It involves sacrifice, but we want it to be meaningful. We want it to be fulfilling. We want you to grow closer to Jesus because of your serving. And one of the ways that we want to demonstrate that uh, and, and show that we are valuing your time is we have put together a servant leader survey where we are inviting you to give feedback on your experience serving on one of our teams. Some of you may have already gotten that link from your team leads. Some of you will get that by Monday, Uh, but you can also get that in the QR code as well. And the reason we do this is because there are some things that we can only know because our servant leaders tell us. And so we have made that, uh, uh, that survey anonymous. And so Please be as honest as you can be. Don't try to hurt anybody's feelings, uh, but be honest, and that would help us to put into place the best practices or to realize, hey, this is what's going really well, and to continue doing that. So would love for you to do that. We really valuable, value your voice and would love that feedback. So that's all I've got for you. I'm going to invite Megan up for the reading of Scripture. Good morning, Bright City. My name is Megan Stolwagen, and I serve on the liturgical team here. Um, If you're able, I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word. And this morning, we'll be reading John 15, verses 12 through 17 in the CSB. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give to you. This is what I command you, love one another. This is the word of the Lord. 
Well, thank you, Megan. If you are new, my name is Sharon. I am one of the pastors here at Bright City Church. And before I kick off our message this morning, I actually wanted to pause to publicly honor Abby Crick and Mark Simpson Voss, who oversee our small groups ministry. They're the ones who organized the winter small group fair. They are the ones who organize small groups throughout the year, who shepherd our small groups leaders as well. And and one thing that is really incredible about our small groups ministry is that we have an incredibly high percentage of our church is in a small group. And that is kind of unusual, but honestly, it's because of the leadership of those two. And so I don't know if Abby is even in here. I think Mark is, but if y'all would join me in just giving them a round of applause because... They really have done an excellent, excellent job. And if you don't know Mark, if you don't know Abby, I encourage you to get to know them. They are two of my favorite people on the planet. But this morning we are continuing our series, Heartaches. This is a relationship series. Last week I looked at the topic of marriage. And this morning we are going to be looking at the topic of friendship. And so I thought I would share with you one of my favorite slash worst memories from high school. One of my, you know, those, those memories of just absolute teenage savagery. And thankfully, this story is not nearly as bad as some stories that I've heard. But when I was a freshman in high school, I was standing in front of my locker and I was getting ready for class. And then one of my friends came up to me and she asked me this really weird question. She says, do you pluck your eyebrows? And I was really confused by this because I had actually never heard of this. I didn't know what she was talking about. This sounded barbaric to me. Like, why would I pull hair out of my face? And so I looked back at her and said, no, you know, why? And this girl, stone cold, looks me dead in the eye and says, because you're supposed to have two eyebrows, not one. And then she turns on her heel and walks away and just leaves me, you know, in the aftermath of, of what she has just said. And this story just always makes me laugh to think about because clearly this was not a mission of goodwill. You know, th this girl did not have it on her heart to make the world a better place one unibrow at a time. This was an act of teenage guerrilla warfare. And a lot of us have similar memories from middle school and high school when we look back and friendship at that time felt less like a gift and more like hazing. But unfortunately, as much as I wish I could say that I left all of those dynamics behind in middle school and high school, that is not the case. Some of the greatest wounds of my adult life have actually come at the hands of other adult friends. And when I look back on the last 10 to 15 years, the, the wounds that really just laid me out, that had me in bed sobbing, that, that took me years to recover were very often friendship wounds. And when I talk to other women in particular, I hear the same thing a lot. And there is a reason for that. I was recently reading a book by a social psychologist named Jonathan Haidt. And he t talks about in this one section of the book that the way that m boys are aggressive is, can be different than the ways that girls are aggressive. He says boys tend to be more physically aggressive, more likely to shove and hit one another. Girls, in contrast, are more relationally aggressive. They try to hurt their rivals' relationships, reputations, and social status. And as much as I wish I could say that as we grow from girls into women that we also outgrow that tendency, but the fact of the matter is for, for a lot of us, and, and myself included, we don't necessarily outgrow that form of aggression. For, for a lot of women, sometimes what happens is we just get better at masking it as something else. And I think that's why so many women have friendship wounds. However, 
this, this type of, of wound does not discriminate exclusively against women. I have stood in the lobby with many men in our church as they have wept. Ike and I have sat in our living room with, with men in our church as, as they have shared their own friendship wounds. And so men experience this as well. However, I read another study that was looking at this other dynamic that is, is somewhat um, more common among men when it comes to the ways that friendship can be difficult. A couple years ago, the Survey Center on American Life found that men are experiencing what they call a friendship recession. It said that one in five men admit to not having a single close friend. And while I know some of you men hear that statistic and think, so? Like, I feel nothing. You know, like, like, I don't, I don't, that, that's not, that's something to actually tease Ike about. Cause I'm like, I yearn for these deep friendships and Ike's kind of like, Meh, you know, and so I know, I know some men, you know, don't have a problem with that. And yet studies of loneliness, studies of, of people who are in lack of close friends, this correlates with all sorts of negative emotional and physical consequences where study after study after study shows that having community, living in community, having close friends who know you, who know what's going on in your life correlates with human flourishing. But all that to say, friendship is hard. We struggle with it in so many different ways, but I don't think that this is an area of our lives where we would look back and say, this was always smooth sailing, that I have this down. I have figured this out. But thankfully, we do have help. This morning, we are going to look at someone in scripture who sustained unimaginable wounds at the hands of his friends. And yet, he never retreated from them. He never put up walls. He never became hard-hearted or cynical about people in general. Instead, he actually continued to prioritize friendship as long as he lived. And that person was Jesus. So this morning we are going to be in John 13, looking at one of the final scenes that we see with Jesus and his disciples, his, his closest group of friends. We're going to be looking at the Last Supper. And if you have your Bibles or if you just want to follow along on the screen, we'll be in John 13 looking at kind of two different passages, verses 21 through 29 and then verses 36 through 38. So starting with John 13, verse 21, this is the Last Supper. It says, when Jesus had said this, he was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples started looking at one another, uncertain which one he was speaking about. One of his disciples, the disciple, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close beside Jesus. Simon Peter motioned to him to find out who it was he was talking about. So he leaned back against Jesus and asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus replied, he's the one I give the piece of bread to after I have dipped it. When he had dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son. After Judas ate the piece of bread, Satan entered him. So Jesus told him, what you're doing, do quickly. None of those reclining at the table knew why he said this to him. Since Judas kept the money bag, some thought that Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. After receiving the piece of bread, he immediately left, and it was night. Now we're going to skip ahead to verse 36 for an exchange between Jesus and Simon Peter. Lord, Simon Peter said to him, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. Lord, Peter asked, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus replied, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, I tell you, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Now, in these passages, 
all the disciples are, are present, but we encounter three specifically that are, that are the main friends in these exchanges. The first is, is John. He's not named specifically, but, but tradition has interpreted whenever it says the disciple Jesus loved, that that is talking about John, who happens to be the author of this gospel. And I will never get over the fact that John only exclusively describes himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. Like every time I read that, I'm like, okay, John. But John was one of Jesus's best friends. Even though the disciples are all his close friends, he is closer to John, Peter, and James. The second friend that we encounter here is Judas, the disciple who betrayed him. And then finally, Peter, the disciple who denied him. And then in the following scene after this is when Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is his, his final time with the disciples before he will be arrested. And, and Jesus is in agony and he is so distraught that he is sweating blood. And yet the disciples cannot stay awake with him. And so again, we, we see a disciple who betrays him, a disciple who denies him, and then all the disciples disappoint him. And together, all of this tells us two important things. First is that Jesus experienced friendship pain. And the second is that Jesus pursued friendship anyway. Not only did he structure his entire ministry around friendship, which is not insignificant, that, that Jesus, I recently saw a quote by Pastor Rich Velotis who commented on how Jesus had communion with God himself and still structured his ministry around communion on earth. That should be meaningful to us. But not only did he structure his entire ministry around friendship, he clearly invited his friends into his presence to share a meal with them, even though he knew full well that they were all about to fail him. And so if Jesus experienced the pain of friendship brokenness, just like the rest of us, and really more so, much more so, what does this teach us, his followers? In a nutshell, what it teaches us is that even though friendship is hard, it is painful, it is the source of, of, of so many wounds for us, and yet friendship is not something to retreat from. Instead, it is something to be modeled and redeemed. Why? Because everyone in this room has a story similar to the one I shared. And, and honestly, I couldn't share in order to honor people who are presently in my life. I couldn't even go into actual adult wounds, but I know we all have them. We all wrestle with this. This is a world that desperately needs the kind of friendship that Jesus displays here and throughout his life, that unconditional love, that, that sacrifice, that care. And, and, and I think about what the world would be like if the church modeled that kind of friendship. What Raleigh Durham would be like if, if these local churches modeled that kind of friendship. And so what I want to do this morning is look at five essential practices of healthy friendship. And, and there are more than five, but I wanted to focus on what we can draw from, from this text here because friendship and friendship brokenness is just so integrally mingled in this text. So starting with number one, the first essential practice for healthy friendship, this one does not seem very spiritual at all. And that is, number one, have realistic expectations for your friends. This does not seem spiritual. This does not seem profound. And yet, the bulk of that text that I just read in John 13 is given to this. What we take away from John 13 is that Jesus knew who these men were. He knew that they were all going to fail him. And even though this did not spare him from pain, what this does for us when we have realistic expectations for people, it does spare us from disillusionment. I think a lot of pain and friendship comes from unspoken or unfulfilled or simply unwise expectations that we saddle people with. 
You know, maybe you expected them to make time for you or to be thoughtful of you or to be more supportive of you, but you weren't taking into consideration their current stage of life, of what what is going on in their lives. Maybe you have certain expectations of your friends of what it means to be attentive, what it means to, to communicate well, and yet you have some friends who they have all these different strengths, but one of them is just not texting you back promptly. And so th- there's an expectation there that creates a strain in that relationship. I think one of the ways that we need to have realistic expectations for people in our lives is, is in in relation to gossip. Like if, if, if you hear a friend who is gossiping about other people, but then you treat them like, I know you're going to hold my confidence. You're not having a realistic expectation of that friendship and it's going to bite you in the end. For me personally, one of the, the wounds that I've experienced, really, I think I've been doing this since high school. I'm like, Jesus, help me to learn this lesson. Help me to learn this lesson. But I tend to have expectations of of friends that they have simply just not agreed to. And a lot of that has to do with my expectations of of what makes a good friend. And and as if my expectation is gospel. Like this is the standard of what makes a good friend. And if you don't live up to it, then you have failed me in some way. And so it's a really healthy practice for us to pause and consider if we have imported our expectations onto other people. And that what is straining our friendship sometimes is not that they are failing to be a good friend to you, but simply they are not failing to live up to the expectations that you have not even communicated to them. So that is number one, have realistic expectations for your friends. Number two, This one should go without saying, but unfortunately, because we're sinners, it does not. Be honest slash don't lie. Another really striking aspect of these passages is Jesus's candor. In a couple other gospel accounts in Matthew and Luke, Jesus has even more of a fleshed out conversation with Judas. And, and one of the noteworthy things about it is how direct he is. He's, he's very clear, very direct with Judas. What he is not is passive aggressive. And we know because John tells us that, that Jesus is actually hurt in this moment. And I think when we're hurt, we, we tend to what we say and how we say it tends to go sideways sometimes. But with Jesus, even though he is hurt, he is not giving a reason for his hurt that is not the real reason. Does that make sense? I know for for me, I've also experienced this sometimes when I'm upset with someone, rather than have that, that hard conversation with them, I will give them a reason that is not the real reason. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus does not play games with people. And that's because Jesus understands that honesty is the lifeblood of a healthy friendship. And while I cannot control how a person treats me, I am absolutely responsible for how I treat them. As soon as you stop being honest, you cut off the very thing that animates intimacy and connection. But in addition to the ways that, that, that dishonesty really stops friendship in its tracks, it's also just deeply dishonoring. Some of you have, have experienced this. I have, have definitely experienced this where someone didn't want to have a hard conversation with me. And so they just kept disappearing or, or giving me excuses or, or giving me reasons that were not the real reason. And not only did it it create, it was almost as if we were kind of operating in two different realities of what is truth right now. It just felt insulting. Like, I know that you're not telling me the truth right now. And one of the ways that I think this actually plays out is as much as we think of dishonesty as speaking like a half truth or, or, or a full lie to somebody, one of the ways that I think we are afraid to be honest or one of the ways that we escape being honest is through ghosting where someone texts you or emails you and you don't wanna have that conversation with them and so you just simply don't respond at all. 
and then you subject this person to this kind of purgatory of wondering, did they get it? And you're, you're kind of blissfully like, who knows? Who knows if, if they, nobody knows, who could know? But this is not honoring. This is not becoming of followers of Jesus. And so if you need to have that hard conversation, don't be harsh, don't be cruel, but don't run away from it either. You know, for some of us, I think we know, it's, it's not even that we're, we're being dishonest so much as we're just being weird. Like you know that your behavior isn't making sense and it's not because you're upset with them, it's actually because of something that's going on in your own life. And you're not prepared to share that, but because you're not prepared to share, you are being weird and you're creating all this ambiguity in your friendship with them. And there are ways that you can be clear without sharing everything. I think of this quote from Brene Brown where she says that clarity is kind. And so to be clear, to be forthcoming so that we don't cast our friends into this ambiguity, but most importantly, if you are simply in the wrong, if you have messed up, if you have hurt someone, that we would have the kind of integrity to confess that honestly without qualification. Because there is no path forward in friendship without honesty. So that is number two. Number three, we don't see in this passage exactly, because Jesus doesn't practice this. Number three is giving the benefit of a doubt. This is not a practice that Jesus models because Jesus does not have to give the benefit of a doubt. Jesus is never wondering what a person is thinking. Jesus is never wondering about someone's motives. He knows, and so he doesn't have to practice curiosity. He already knows. But the reason that I included this in here is that this failure to give the benefit of a doubt is actually part of what torpedoed Judas's relationship with Jesus. Because prior to this scene, the last interaction that we see between Jesus and Judas is when Mary is anointing Jesus' feet with expensive perfume. And this really bothers Judas. He says, you know, what a waste. We could have given this money to the poor. And what John tells us is that this complaint is not sincere that Judas was actually stealing money from the money bag. And so what he was really upset about was that he couldn't have that money. But the reason this really stood out to me is that the, the heart of this complaint is so similar to many of the criticisms that are leveled at Jesus throughout his ministry. Over and over and over again, the religious authorities are constantly twisting Jesus's actions. They're constantly running his, his actions through the least charitable filter possible. And I don't think it's, it's unfair to say that, that in narrating Jesus's actions that way, it was poisoning Judas's own heart. And we often do the same. When we have some data points in a friend's actions and, and we don't exactly know how they connect with one another when there's some information missing, if our go-to is just to assume the worst, to interpret without charity, to interpret without curiosity, we will be the ones poisoning that friendship. I heard a really interesting quote by Danielle Jackson. She is a friendship coach, which I did not know was a thing, but sounds actually like a pretty wise idea. And she said, a lot of friendships end prematurely because of stories we invent and then tell ourselves about the other person. And I can relate to that because I did that like a month ago. I had a friend who I had not heard from in a little while, and I tried to reach out to her a couple times to get together with her. And there was like two or three times where, where every time I tried to get together with her, she had a reason why she couldn't get together. And so I created this whole story basically about how she was done with me that we'd had a good run, but now she must be, you know, have, have moved on to greener pastures. And I actually started to grieve this friendship. So I started to emotionally inhabit a reality that I had invented. And then come to find out, she was not done with me. She just had some stuff going on in her own family. And we have since talked and everything is fine. And so I'm really grateful that I did not interact with her 
based on those assumptions. Because if I had, I would have been the one to sabotage our friendship. Let's be friends who give one another the benefit of a doubt, especially in a polarized culture like ours, where we are constantly assuming the worst about one another. What a grace. What a grace to be in a community where you're always given the benefit of a doubt. And if you find yourself in that place where you are confused about a friend's behavior, then go back to number two and simply be honest. The fourth practice that we get from Jesus in this passage is not exclusive to his friend. It is, friends, it is a way of life for Jesus, and that is desiring their good, actively working for their good. And we see this play out in reference to his friends in, in two ways in John 13. The first is in Jesus' interaction with Judas when he says that he will dip the bread and hand it to someone. This act of, of dipping the bread in the cup and, and handing it to a guest was actually a customary act of honoring a guest. And so in doing that, knowing full well that Judas was going to betray him, he still publicly honors him. It's as if he is giving Judas every opportunity to make a different choice. He, he yearns for more for Judas. And he also yearns for more for Peter. He hopes for more for Peter. And he actually encourages him in that direction. And in verse 36, in the same passage that he says, you will deny me three times. And yet he also says in verse 36, but you will follow me later. This denial is not the nail in the coffin of our friendship. And Jesus has this posture of, of redemption for every person he encounters. He even has it for his own executioners. Jesus is the one who on a cross cries out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. For every person that Jesus encountered, he desired their good. He worked for their good. And we are called to do the same. Whether someone hurts us or if we simply just don't understand the choices that they are making. It's, it's not even necessarily that they are making destructive decisions. Maybe they're just making different choices than you would have made. And it's, it's amazing. I don't know if you guys are like this, but how quickly if, if someone chooses a different path for their lives, I'm like, I don't know about that. Like how quickly we, we become naysayers instead of our friend's greatest supporters. But another reason why this is so important, desiring our friend's good, honestly desiring our enemy's good, is that this is the single practice. This, this is it. And this is a part of forgiveness. This is the single practice that protects us against the soul withering effects of bitterness and contempt. So that is number four, but that leads us to number five, which is kind of an important follow-up to number four. Desiring someone's good, possibly working for their good, does not mean keeping them in your life. And no one short of Jesus sets us free to do this, which is why number five is when necessary, you need to let that friend go. In verse 27, Jesus says to Judas, what you are doing, do quickly. He doesn't argue with Judas. He doesn't ask why. He doesn't try to convince him not to betray him. He just releases him. And part of the reason this is a healthy practice is that we can create added unnecessary pain by holding on to friendships that we need to release. But there's another way that, that we can create added unnecessary pain in, in this department of friendship brokenness, and that is simply classifying something as the ending of a friendship when it is simply the changing of a friendship. Something that has been a helpful tool for me is this theory called Dunbar's number. And there's a, a graph that goes with this. So Dunbar's number typically, if, if you've heard this before, refers to this number 150, which is the max number of relationships that a person can maintain. And as you move further to the right, 
those ties become more and more loose. So 500 is a max number of acquaintances, 1500 is the max number of known names, and then 5000, if you keep going, is actually the max number of known faces. But if you move to the left, this is gonna be the tighter and tighter circles of friendship. So 35 to 50 is kind of the max number of relatively close friends, people that you see regularly in your life who, who know you, know what's going on with you. Then 15, we're getting to a, a tighter friendship circle, but then five is really your most intimate friends. And so this is going to be possibly your spouse, your, your parents, um, if you have adult children, maybe one or two best friends, chosen family, whatever it is, this is a very, very small group. And I suspect that for a lot of us, the, the pain that we're feeling is not necessarily the end of a friendship, but simply a friendship that is on the left moving towards the right. And this happens throughout our lives for a lot of different reasons. You know, your life stage changes, your priorities change, your, your geography changes. But for me, it has been really helpful. It, it is painful. Anytime you move from the left to the right, that is going to probably be painful. But it has been very helpful for me to have a different category besides total loss. Like the way that I'm thinking about that, that shift doesn't have to just be that friendship is over. And so I like having a broader lexicon, like more than one category for this, because however you categorize that shift is, is how you are going to experience it. But of course, sometimes friendships do end. Judas was never reconciled to Jesus even after everything that Jesus did. And if you come here this morning, and, and this is the one out of the series that you knew, this is gonna hit me really close to home. This, this is one of my number one pains that I am in the middle of a friendship falling apart or maybe a friendship fell apart and I still have not recovered from it. I'm still actively grieving. If that is you, I want you to know that I am actually there with you. I have a number of friendships that have been broken and that feel unresolved and there is still no apparent resolution in sight. And so to be perfectly honest with you, I was kind of dreading this message. Alex and Ike made me preach it. I told them I shouldn't be the one and they were like, then you should be the one. But as I've wrestled with this this week and, and prayed through it, there's, there's two things that I've really settled on to, to make my way forward. One that I honestly was just personally convicted about this week. And that is the importance that if you find yourself in this place with a, a, a friend that it has fallen apart, it is broken, you don't know if it will ever be healed, that rather than ruminating over this, constantly deconstructing it. How, what went wrong? Why is it still broken? Will it ever be healed again? Instead, what I've realized I need to do is to pray for their good. I need to write their names down and every single week I need to not just pray for them, but to pray for their good. And then the second thing that has really comforted me in this is to trust in resurrection. You know, when, when Judas stands before Jesus in judgment, we don't know how that conversation will go. We have no idea. But we do know that every other disciple who abandoned Jesus or disappointed Jesus that final week of his life was ultimately restored to Jesus. The empty tomb meant God can always bring life out of the dead places. And so I'm going to invite the band to, to come up, but, but I do want to say this, this brings me no small amount of comfort, especially when I think of friends where there is brokenness, but we are still following Jesus. The way that I think about that is that 
right now in our lives, we are not walking together. But both of us are standing on the same road to redemption. And so I might not see reconciliation on this side of eternity, but because of Jesus, I can declare that one day I will. And so I want to speak that over you this morning as well. But as we go into this next song to prepare our hearts for communion, what I also want you to reflect on is that, and this is going to be a theme through this whole series, is that wherever you experience relational pain, whether that is in your marriage, whether that is with your friendships, I think next week we'll be talking about parent wounds, whatever it is, it's easy for our understanding of the love of God to be skewed by the brokenness of of human love. And so if you're coming in just feeling really beat up by friendships right now, what we're gonna sing right now, what we're gonna declare right now, is that in whatever ways human love is imperfect, Jesus's love is not.